good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I think Dr. Paul will join us in about five to ten minutes, and then he will just sneak in from that side, and we'll include him in the conversation. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what's around the corner, what do we expect over the coming ten years to happen in reality, what are the big things that are coming, and what are different leaders in the sector coming from the pharmaceutical industry or from provision seeing happen, really? Gizem, let's maybe start with you. If we think 10 years ahead, you're representing one of the biggest innovators in the industry uh, with GSK. There must be a lot of stuff in the pipeline. So tell us a bit, what do you expect will really change over the next 10 years in how we provide healthcare? So I think the biggest change has started two years ago with, with the pandemic, because before that, it was just in a more silo manner. Pharmaceutical industry was trying to, there were collaborations, but it was more about, you know, a little bit of a healthy competition about the innovative medicine. But pandemic thought us something. First of all, you have to be very fast. Uh, and, and second, uh, you need more uh, collaboration and you have to complement each other to make things happen in a faster and more targeted manner. And that's, that's what we have seen in uh, vaccines, that's what we have seen in, in the treatments as well. And that was one of the experiences that as GSK we have also a collaboration in a very faster manner. We provided medicine uh, to, to UAE during that pandemic environment. So that was for me an important indicator of regardless of your pipeline or R&D activities, the mindset that is, is coming up for the upcoming 10 years as well. The pharma industry, I believe, should be more in a collaboration manner uh, we're going to be seeing more, I would say, different sorts of alliances or um, partnerships in different matters, and GSK has been doing it in different areas, in vaccines, in treatment. Uh, so that, that's, that's number one. The second piece is, of course, uh, genomics is going to play a, an important role. Uh, GSK is also, we have got a big genomics team, and we have different collaborations with UK Biobank, for instance, uh, 23andMe uh, with the Finland uh, as well. So different work is being done on the genomics field, which is an interesting area because it's with the, you know, more on the targeted way of R&D activities are moving on. So I believe the pharma industry would be more keen on targeted treatments and uh, the genomics will have a, a strong role in, in terms of uh, drug research and development. And for sure, the digitalization, artificial intelligence, and all these sorts of stuff in terms of the analyzing the data, increasing the pace of R&D activities will have a pivotal role. So these will be the three major enablers of, uh, of the innovation uh, in the future. Thank you, Gizem, for that perspective. Um, Alan, let me turn to you. You've been leading a hospital group in the Northern Emirates and obviously have uh, a rehab center here in Abu Dhabi and you've been doing that for the last few years. A lot of work to be done there. If, uh, if you think about your plan for the next 10 years as a CEO, what are the major shifts that you anticipate and how do you organize for them? Thank, thanks, Pencho. Um, Yes, I, I do see a lot of change uh, coming in the next decade. If I look at hospitals traditionally, um, technology, we've been fairly slow adopters of new technology. Um, most of the technologies to date have been um, supportive technologies around instruments, equipment, that type of thing. I think the next decade will see the model of care change. And certainly that's something of Pure Health we're working on uh, significantly at the moment to look at the role of the hospital and the role of how services are delivered perhaps in a different way in the future. Um, hospitals, I think, will become very intense places where very short, acute interventions happen with high intensity, 
but many of the services that the community would think of as hospital services today, in a decade's time, I believe, will either be ambulatory care or home care or virtualised with technology support. So I can see a very big change coming in the next decade in the way we use our hospitals. Along with that will come a, a, a very large exercise in working with the community to change the perception of safety is in a hospital to perhaps more safety is at home and outside of the hospital and deliver care in a different way. So these will be quite big challenges. I think there's lots of technology on the horizon that's helping that. Um, COVID, one of the silver linings of COVID is that um, remote technology, remote monitoring, telehealth, all of these different innovations that we saw introduced overnight in, over the last couple of years would have taken a decade otherwise to come to us. And I think now we have an opportunity to not let go of that. The community came to trust different models. We now need to take those steps further and look at how we change and embed that into our way of thinking. I think the community will accept it. Um, we, we look at the adoption of social media and, and technologies at home at the moment. The community does take this in other areas, but to date we haven't given them good healthcare tools that they felt they could trust. A decade ago, there was no such thing as a wearable eye watch with technology in it. Today we've got ECGs on your wrist. Um, another decade, it's hard to imagine what won't be able to be monitored remotely. So the, the idea of coming to hospital to have a diagnosis done will probably be very rare. It'll be treatment that will be delivered, high acuity treatments, but most diagnosis services will be done through remote communication, remote monitoring. You can imagine the average household will have a diagnostic system somehow connected to a healthcare provider, be it a chaperone of healthcare or what it might be. But we can see these changes coming. It's now about adopting them into the community and getting trust about those. Thank you, Alan. Very interesting. So maybe a bit scary for all the diagnostic centers that already exist out there, the shift that you're describing. Jorge, you've been leading probably the most prominent tertiary quaternary care institution in the, in the UAE, maybe in the broader region. So people are always looking to the Cleveland Clinic and your setup here in terms of what's happening on the innovation front? What's your plan for the next 10 years? Wow. So uh, that's a very uh, exciting question. Uh, and, and I will kind of try to um, convey this vision based on what we think medicine is going to be in 10 years. And it's obvious that medicine is going to be personalized. And when we talk about personalized medicine, uh, you need to understand the, the interaction between three main components. Biology, or g genomics, or proteomics, your own makeup, as it's been discussed before. Lifestyle, and the environment. I think that the overlap of these three will ultimately lead into what we call precision medicine. And, and I think an understanding the interactions between environment, your lifestyle, and your genetic makeup will be where medicine is going to move in the future. For example, today, uh, we know that certain cancers express certain genetic profile based on the profile of these cancers or, or, or uh, um, these tumors. You can choose different type of treatments. Uh, today, we know that um, certain uh, individuals based on ethnicity, have a makeup that make it resistant to certain medications. For example, if you look at us in the audience, I dare say probably five or ten of us are taking Plavix. And out of these five or ten, probably three or four have resistance based on their genetic makeup. So I think that medicine of the future will be a more thorough understanding of us as individuals and interactions between these, these two main influences, lifestyle and the environment, and how we respond to treatments or don't respond to treatments, how we may be at risk or not for certain things. And then when you make a circle around those, 
hospitals and care delivery systems are going to start understanding how we set up things in such a way that we can all start to align behind this, this new way of delivering care. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jorge. Um, <clears throat> everybody's speaking about technology, and it also came up uh, in, in all of your statements so far. So I'm wondering today, what has already changed in how we use technology? And what do you think are going to be the one or two game changers over the next decade that we'll really see applied in clinical practice that we're not yet seeing today? Maybe, maybe Gizem, we start with you first again. Uh, thank you. So I think we have to look at the topic of and, and different pillars because one side of the story is technology use in R&D, which is being done in the research and development and it's massively influencing actually the pace uh, of, of drug delivery. So it's, it's been literally a, a change, a big change actually in, in terms of because uh, 20, 25 years back when I have started the industry at that time we were visiting the uh, research laboratories and the average time frame of a drug is like 12 years. So are we going to wait for 12 years for any drug right now? It's it's not the case and, and technology is a big enabler and the data usage and of course again as I have mentioned this genomics data in the uh, R&D and the use of AI in all of these statistical techniques or so digital and statistics is a big play in that part. This is number one. Number two is in our clinical practice, if you, if you come back to our own reality here, there are two sides of the story. One is pharmaceutical industry is, um, I would say, a conventional industry working through the sales representatives or medical team members to promote their products. So this has been evolving with the digital initiatives. Is it a game changer? Not. Complementary? Yes. Are we ahead of the game? We are very, very behind the game. But the, the model might be evolving in the future how we deliver the scientific information to our healthcare professionals in that very fast-pacing environment. What sort of roles or com uh, competencies that we require from our team members is going to evolve. So that's going to be a more, I would say, advanced, uh, more capable teams delivering high-end information. So that's going to be the second part of the story. Our model of communication should evolve. And the third piece is the patients. So patient empowerment was an old topic, but it's increasingly having risks as well, bearing access to all sorts of information, how they're going to be a pivotal role in terms of their own, owning their own diseases or prevention, or how they're, they're going to act is also another part of the story. And are we going to be talking about only treatment, or we would be speaking more on prevention, uh, vaccination, early you know, awareness, as you rightly mentioned, like the uh, lifestyle changes and for instance we're trying to make like healthy aging with different groups different collaborations so this is going to be the other topic that pharmaceutical industry uh, should have to play a pivotal role not placing itself as only a vendor of or a supplier of a medicine but more a partner in the healthcare on different pillars starting from R&D starting from um, different lifestyle or partnerships in terms of the overall healthcare of the uh, of the community. So this will be the mindset shift as well. So digital by itself or AI or machines will not going to solve the problem. They will accelerate on certain pillars. Um, but I think it's a bigger or a holistic picture that we need to look at. Thank you, Gizem. <clears throat> Dr. Paul, welcome. Thank you. Glad you safely arrived. My apologies. <laughs> Running late, clinical duties. Uh. Great, Sometimes great to have you un here. Unpredictable, but uh, uh, so I'm glad, glad to make um, again my apologies to the audience and to you. Glad to have you here. So let us throw a first question at you. So Gizem was just explaining how she sees from the pharmaceutical industry technology enabling a different type of speed of development, also engagement with physicians and the clinical community and patient engagement that she foresees over the next decade. You are part of the leadership of one of the most prominent private institutions delivering care in the UAE. What do you see changing based on this background? How is technology changing the way you work 
uh, over the next decade? See, um, um, technology, uh, as, as I think of it, and we get so excited about uh, the things that, that are coming in the pipeline and how it has changed the way we practice. Um, and you ask people around, and the main concern is that a fear of dehumanizing the patient care. But if we look at it from a different angle, I think uh, technology has helped us somehow rehumanize the practice of medicine by taking care of a lot of the uh, clerical work that physicians do and allow us to focus more on the patient, the patient experience. Um, some of the things we've done at the American Hospital, for example, uh, has been uh, using AI predictive model during the COVID-19 to help us predict uh, based on clinical and biochemical presentation, which patient is more likely to end up requiring intensive care and which is likely to do fine on the ward and who is okay going home and be managed uh, at the convenience and comfort of their home. Uh, and this has helped a lot uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, other things we, uh, we've looked at are um, uh, using AI engine to uh, predict likelihood of no-show, timing, day, uh, etc. cetera. Um, if we have to expand beyond the actual day-to-day -day routine, uh, a lot of uh, uh, artificial intelligence technology has been reshaping medical education, for example. A lot of the uh, concept that were um, abstract concept and, and care, now you're in a classroom, you can project a hologram of the human body and you can explain all of these things. So this is reshaping the education. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, institutions in the U.S. are already using um, uh, technology to uh, improve uh, education in different aspects. For example, you have a virtual uh, patient with chronic illnesses. How can you be more empathetic to that patient? Uh, a, uh, other models that looking at challenging patients, end of life issues. Can you bring back that patient into the uh, pleasant journey outside the setting of where they are in the hospital? So technology has helped in different ways uh, so far and definitely a lot of exciting things coming in the, in the pipeline. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, you mentioned the importance of, first of all, how it is already impacting day-to-day -day clinical practice today, but also you mentioned the impact it has on education. Uh, Jorge, if, I'm, if I may ask you, how do you prepare your institution uh, for the changes and the opportunities that technology is presenting over the next decade? Many of your most senior staff that is leading is probably in our age group, so not necessarily grown up with uh, med schools where they had uh, in silico models to model stuff. Uh, so how do you take this generation and equip them to lead uh, what is ahead of us? Uh, that's, a, that's a fascinating uh, question and it's uh, something I have taken. Um, the, so we, we have shared the vision. So we, we share the ambition for Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi to be a leader in precision medicine and personalized medicine. We have outlined what we understand by precision medicine. And, and now we're starting to make sure that we lead with very clear and tangible examples. And I'll give you a few. We opened the cancer center and we have brought a piece of equipment that is the first in this part of the Gulf. It's probably beyond the Gulf. It's the first one certainly in the whole Cleveland Clinic system globally. And it's a piece of adaptive radiotherapy. So what, what does that mean? So for, for patients that need radiation therapy, 
this technology incorporates artificial intelligence and as the treatment is being delivered and the tumor is being shrunk on real time the beam is adapting to the reduction in in the area that the radiation is delivered so when you use these examples and when you say because at times and, and I think it, it's been brought up by the panelists we talk about artificial intelligence we talk about technology and, it's, and these are broad terms and people don't necessarily understand how they can relate to their day-to-day -day operations and how it can help the output in, in improving patient care you start leading with these things and the, 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 the whole set of caregivers starts understanding what are we looking from a technology perspective. The same thing is with labor reduction. So uh, we, we have been challenged throughout the last year and a half with uh, workforce, uh, shortages in workforce. And so the challenge is how do we use technology to bridge that gap of, of uh, workforce? So how can technology uh, help our caregivers to do their, their tasks and, and therefore be able to be more at the bedside, more time at the bedside. Uh, and how do we incorporate predictive algorithms in whatever nature we, we, we're talking into helping the bottom line, which is improving patient care, improving, improving patient experience. So I think as, as you start identifying concrete examples, the whole mindset changes. And our own caregivers are starting to bring us proposed ideas to be incorporated into these algorithms or technology that we may need to bring on, on, on the hospital to help us deliver what we are ultimately trying to deliver. Thank you, Jorge. Alan. I'm thinking you, we spoke a bit outside about the fact that you are taking a group of hospitals that have been operating somewhat separately in the past and creating a network of facilities that more holistically are catering to the catchment area that you are responsible for. I assume there is a lot of topics around efficiency and how to um, improve how your workforce works together. What, what is technology going to do to help you create that? Yes, thank you, Panko. Uh, it, it's, I guess it fundamentally is changing the model of delivery of care. Um, when I think about healthcare at the moment, it's a very episodic inter interaction with the patient or the, the, the community. You, they might be at an outpatient visit, three months later they might turn up in the emergency department, but there's a gap in between, there's no communication and we don't know what's happened in their life and they feel disconnected. So one of the things we're thinking about in our network of hospitals is how do we actually interact with the patient the whole time? So that when there is an episode of acute care and an intervention, we're not trying to recapture what happened in the last three months. We're now focused on using that information to quickly diagnose the current circumstance and deal with it. So. I can see these models evolving where the workforce teams will change. Um, I think we will have wearable technology so that some of that gap is filled in. The teams, be they uh, doctors, nurses, health chaperones or whatever we might call them in the future, are actually part of that person's life, if somewhat remotely, continuously. And when they need to engage with the system, we can plug them into the most appropriate place at the right time to get the care when they need it. So that it's not a reactive model so much as more a um, partnering model with the community. And I think that's going to be one of the key things of building trust in the system going forward. That the, the patients must have trust. I think it was mentioned earlier that sometimes technology can feel alienating and I think we've got to put a human element back into that by taking the technology into the background and bringing the interaction into the foreground. But it's a continuous interaction and that's what we're trying to think about. How would we model our network to reflect that? Thank you. So I'm done with questions and would love to open it to the floor. Any 
questions. I see a hand raised there. Is there somebody with a microphone? So when we're looking at an eye to the future, I'm just looking at it from a patient's perspective, how the patient is going to benefit while we're looking at insurance processes related to the healthcare. So that's the simple way to put that question out. I, um, I'll have a first comment and then maybe Paul. Uh, look, I think the, the issue, as we all know in the industry, is to make sure that we're paying for delivering and receiving the correct care at the correct time um, as smoothly as possible. And a lot of the system at the moment is geared administratively and with a burden towards trying to see whether the proposed treatment is the appropriate treatment and there are lots and lots of approval steps in that that from a patient perspective can be frustrating, from a hospital perspective can be very frustrating, I'm sure from an insurance perspective um, are equally frustrating. I think this is where the knowledge piece around the needs of that patient or the person um, is where we need to focus our um, technology to understand whether it's pharmacogenomics, whether it's uh, the right sort of adaptive radiotherapy, what it might be that is in advance known what is going to work best for this patient. Because then if the insurer, the hospital and the patient are all aware of the nature of that patient and the nature of the treatment that will succeed, then we should be able to smooth that pathway out and make sure that we're not prescribing inappropriate drugs because they won't work on this patient. Uh, um, we can get to the correct treatment much faster. And I think that's a challenge that we all have to work with. Certainly I know within the medical office and the Pure Health Group, we are looking at how we join some of those things together and join the system because at the moment the system is very fragmented and we need better dialogue. And I think technology can help with that. Paul, Alan, Gizem, Jorge, thank you so much for thank your you. contributions and for the lovely discussion. Have a great day.